This next group of chapters um, is over the nervous system, and the nervous system is our major controlling system in the body. Number 11 talks about fundamentals, 12 is central nervous system, 13 is the peripheral nervous system, and that's where we end to take a test over 11 through 13. 14 is the autonomic nervous system, and that finishes up, that finishes up the nervous system. So when we talk about this master controlling and communicating system of the body, there are three major functions. First of all, information comes in. That's sensory input. So everything that you experience, you touch, you feel, you see, you hear, you taste, you smell, all that information comes in and that's called sensory input. Now, the integration center is the second part. So integration is where you interpret what comes in and then motor output is being able to respond to stimuli by activating things that are called effector organs. Now effector organs could be skeletal muscle that you control. It could be a smooth muscle associated with your digestive organs that you don't control. The heart, the glands of the body that provide secretions, those are all sorts of output, but you don't control it all. Um, so three things, remember, these are major functions, sensory input, integration, motor output. This picture shows a breakdown of the entire nervous system. So the first thing is that there are two major branches that you have the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord here, the central nervous system. Then you have the peripheral nervous system. That's all the nerves that radiate off from the brain and the spinal cord. So cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and they provide lines of communication between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. So I like to refer to these nerves as like the wiring, the communication, you know, that um, goes, be, carries information from place to place. So two major systems, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system is divided, subdivided into several categories. And just pay attention to the colors here because blue is sensory. Remember, we said that sensory was incoming information. That term is also called afferent or afferent. Afferent, incoming information. And efferent, motor output, is efferent. So just one letter difference there between those two words and they mean something entirely different. So the blue is incoming and the red is outgoing. So you have sensory information, afferent division that brings in information from the body. So from your receptors in your skin, touch receptors, pain receptors, pressure receptors, hot and cold receptors, and also visceral sensory. Viscera means internal organs. You can feel when you have a stomach ache or when you have indigestion or, or, or abdominal pain, any of that. So you have feelings in your viscera that's translated to the central nervous system. Um, so this system conducts impulses from the receptors to the central nervous system. Now your output, efferent division, those are motor nerve fibers. Motor means that you're connecting to things that are going to move, muscles of some kind. So it conducts impulses from the central nervous system to effectors. And those effectors could be any of the types of muscles, smooth, skeletal, or cardiac, and all the glands of the body to release their secretions. Many of these you have no control over. Now, if we further subdivide this and break it into the different effectors, you have the somatic nervous system, which controls skeletal muscles. They call that somatic, voluntary, conducts impulses from the central nervous system to skeletal muscle. Okay, so somatic, you control. Then there's that autonomic nervous system that controls the um, effectors that you have no control over. So visceral motor, okay, involuntary. So again, internal organs, so churning of the stomach, peristalsis in the intestines, all that you do not have any control over. Um, and it conducts impulses from the central nervous system to the heart. That's another one. Smooth muscle in the walls of those organs and glands of the body. So that is covered in chapter 14. Okay, that's a whole different 
whole different thing. And you can take the autonomic nervous system and subdivide it into two separate branches, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. And if you've taken psychology, you've probably already talked about these. So the parasympathetic conserves energy and, and takes care of all the housekeeping chores, like the resting and digesting and things like that that go on um, when you're not in an emergency situation. The sympathetic is what we call the fight or flight response. So it mobilizes the body systems during activity. So this is an overall breakdown, okay, of the entire system, and we're going to go through it um, bit by bit. So there are cells that are responsible for carrying this information, passing along electrical stimuli, and these are called nerve cells now, or neurons. And the properties of these neurons are that they're excitable. So it's similar to um, muscles that we talked about in chapter nine, that they are able to respond to stimuli. And they have this ability to conduct or pass electrical signals to other cells. And then they secrete things. They're, the secretions that they produce are called neurotransmitters. Those are your chemical messengers and axon terminals that carry the information to the cells that they are associated with. So this is the language of the neurons, is the neurotransmitters. So you have functional classes of your neurons. So there's functional and there's structural. Functional is how they perform their actions and structural is what they look like. So the functional classes, sensory, afferent, they transmit impulses toward the central nervous system. Interneurons, these are in your integrative um, center. Because remember we said there were three functional classes right at the beginning of this lecture. The first picture showed that, okay? So in this integration center, they shuttle signals through the central nervous system pathways. And by the way, keep in mind that interneurons are only found in the central nervous system. That's something to know. And then your motor, motor neurons as a functional class, they're efferent, remember. They carry impulses away from the CNS. Now this is just looking at the typical neuron, okay, and what it, what it actually looks like. So a neuron is a very um, strange looking cell. Um, it has a body. There's the body and the body is called the soma. And then it has a long axon and it can have multiple uh, processes that are called dendrites. Now you want to make sure you know what these things are. Okay, soma is the body. The dendrites are the receptive regions. So that's where incoming information gets picked up. So incoming information goes in by the dendrites and then axon carries the information away, okay? So it generates the information, passes it along and axon terminals, remember, is where your neurotransmitters are stored. That's the secretory region. So it contains a nucleus. Um, you also have the nucleolus here, so it has organelles just like other cells have. It is the major biosynthetic center because you're going to be making neurotransmitters here. Neurons are amitotic. They don't have any centrioles, but they have a lot of endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum, those aggregates are called Nissl bodies. Page two of the notes has the spelling for this, N-I-S-S-L bodies. And this is your rough endoplasmic reticulum, because remember, you have to make a lot of neurotransmitters that are going to be sent down here, down the axon, and they're stored in these axon terminals. Now, this axon hillock, this is the region where information is actually um, sent through the axon. And um, this is where your axon actually begins. And it's going to be very important because if that neuron is going to fire and send information down the axon, the decision is made at this little toll booth here as to whether it's going to go or not. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so that's all the basic structures with the exception of the axon having a coating around it usually that's called the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath in a lot of your neurons is made up of these little beads and they're called Schwann cells.
This is typical of the peripheral nervous system neurons. And the direction of flow of the electrical impulse goes from the axon hillock down the axon away to the axon terminals. In between these Schwann cells that make the myelin are these little gaps. Okay, and these are called nodes of Ranvier. And these are very, very important because as we talk about how electrical stimulus is passed along an axon, this design is very critical to making these impulses go very fast. And I will talk about that a little bit later. Now this picture is showing you structural classifications of neurons by how they're shaped. And they are called multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar neurons depending upon how many dendrites and axons that they have. So a multipolar neuron has a lot of dendrites and one long axon. And see the axon is heavily myelinated. And you will find that 99% of all of your neurons are multipolar. They make up all the neurons that are found in the central nervous system. And also your motor efferent pathways are all multipolar neurons. So 99% of your neurons are multipolar. Bipolar, one dendrite, one axon. Where you find these is special senses, no myelin. We'll talk about those in chapter 15 when we get there. Unipolar, one long axon. So receptive endings, effector endings, cell bodies hanging off to the side, but it's one long axon. And you find these in sensory afferent pathways, okay? Afferent incoming pathways are all sensory neurons. So transport along the axon. So axons generate and transmit action potentials. They secrete neurotransmitters from the axon terminals. Now the movement can occur in two ways, but most often it's anterograde. That's away from the cell bodies. So the information goes from the soma to the axon terminals where the neurotransmitter is stored. Now, sometimes you will find that microorganisms can gain access to the body by going retrograde. And um, the chickenpox virus did this. It would go up and it would cause an infection and you'd break out initially. And then the virus would go into the lumbar nerves primarily, sometimes it went trigeminal, and stay in the trunks of those nerves and stay dormant. And then years later, they would go anterograde away from the lump, from those nerve, those roots, and go along the axons and make eruptions called shingles. But the initial, the initial process of gaining access, gaining access to the body and going dormant, that was a retrograde type of event. So, um, but most of your uh, impulses go from the nerve cell body down the axon to the axon terminals. So your supporting cells, there are cells that provide a supportive scaffold um, for the neurons. So there's a cast of characters we have to talk about. So some of them are scaffolding. They hold the neurons together and hold the circulation, the little capillaries in close proximity to those neurons so they can get their blood supply. Um, they also segregate and insulate the neurons. They guide young neurons to the proper connections and they promote health and growth. These are the functions of all of the supporting cells called the neuroglia. Well, here's what they are. The first one is called an oligodendrocyte. That's a big word, okay, but it makes the myelin in the central nervous system. So here's something I want you to keep straight. N oligodendrocytes, they make the myelin in the central nervous system. The Schwann cells that I mentioned earlier when I showed you the picture of the neuron with the big axon and the little beads, the Schwann cells make the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes, central nervous system, um, Schwann cells, peripheral nervous system. These cells are ependymal cells. Now they line the cavities and open spaces in the brain and spinal cord where cerebral spinal fluid flows. And they actually have cilia that keeps this fluid, this fluid flowing in one direction. These are microglial cells. These are defensive cells that are like phagocytes, but they're found around the neurons. 
and they can monitor the health of the neurons. And if you see a lot of these cells in a particular area, it may indicate that there is an injury in that area. These are the most abundant of all of your uh, micro uh, neuroglia, and these are called astrocytes. Astrocytes are the ones that have, um, they're called astrocytes because they're shaped like stars. They have a lot of processes. And they have these bulbous feet that wrap around um, extensions off of the neurons. So your dendrites, they can hang on to those, hang on to blood vessels, and they provide scaffolding. They hold things together. And because they make an extra layer around capillaries, they also contribute to what we call the blood-brain barrier which restricts a lot of things from getting into the brain. So um, also, they tend to be the ones that result in a lot of problems, brain tumors, um, any type of um, excessive growth of tissues. Usually it's these astrocytes that are able to be mitotic and cause you the problems. So they can replace damaged neurons with scar tissue or what they call sclerosis if there is an injury. And astrocytoma is the most common type of glioma. It's a brain tumor. And greater than 50% of all of your tumors are most common in the, cere in the cerebrum anyway. So astrocytes, they're good. They also mop up neurotransmitters that go into the extracellular space and they put them back into the neurons where they belong. So they have a lot of functions, most numerous of all of your um, supportive cells. So Schwann cells, we talked about them being the ones that actually produce the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. So you can see how this happens. A Schwann cell actually wraps around the axon and then it keeps wrapping around and around and around and around. And what's making the myelin sheath is the cell membrane and the cell membrane is made of phospholipids right so you have this coating of phospholipid now lipid or fat is a very good insulation and there's your axon now if you think about us referring to these axons as being like a wire the inside of the wire has some type of conducting metal and then it's surrounded by plastic and plastic makes a good insulation so this is kind of similar in that you have the axon that can carry the electrical impulses with these layers and layers of fat wrapped around it making the insulation there's a nice electron micrograph this is magnified 24,000 times showing you the axon and the multiple layers of the myelin sheath so the importance of the myelin sheath is that it makes sure that the conduction goes through the axon uninterrupted. Now there is a disease that is an autoimmune disease that affects primarily young adults. It's called MS and the myelin sheaths are destroyed and the immune system actually attacks the myelin. So it's an autoimmune disease where you develop antibodies that destroy the myelin. And as the myelin is destroyed, um, you have these hardened lesions that are formed called sclerosis. This is scar tissue. And the nerve impulse can actually slow and eventually cease. So what happens is when the myelin is removed or the pathway is interrupted, then to replace that myelin, the cell puts up a lot more sodium channels along that part of the axon so that the pathway and the depolarization wave can continue uninterrupted so this is what causes the cycles of relapse and remission so you have this um, relapse where the myelin is destroyed and then the remission happens when you replace those damaged areas with sodium channels so you see this cycle of relapse and remission characteristic of uh, multiple sclerosis these are all the symptoms, visual disturbances, weakness, loss of muscular control, speech disturbances, and urinary incontinence, depend on, depending upon where the problem is. So treatment, drugs that modify the immune system's activity, improve lives, things like there's some types of, there's interferon, beta interferon, beta seron is 
is quite effective. Anti-inflammatories, um, and they're constantly coming up with newer types of um, treatments for MS. So, conduction velocity. What determines the speed of velocity in our transmission through the axon? So, what really affects it is the axon diameter. Larger diameter fibers have less resistance to local current flow, so a faster impulse connection. And myelination. Continuous conduction in my unmyelinated axons is much slower. When you have that coating, it's a whole lot faster. And that type of transmission through myelinated axons is called saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction. So resting membrane potential. This is something that we've talked about in muscles. But your resting potential is negative on the inside. And remember that where are these electrolytes? Sodium is usually higher concentration on the outside. Potassium is lower concentration on the inside. And so there is this difference. More sodium on the outside. So sodium is positively charged. So you have more pluses on the outside, less on the inside. So it's more negative inside. So the actual voltage difference can vary negative 40 millivolts to negative 90 millivolts inside. This is termed polarized. Okay, you have a difference in charge, positive outside, negative inside. And this difference is generated by a lot of different electrolytes, not just sodium and potassium like we talked about in muscle cells, but it's the ionic makeup of the intracellular fluid versus the extracellular fluid. And this differential makes it so that the permeability of the plasma membrane is affected, okay? So here's what happens, the resting state. All your gates are closed, okay? No ions are moving through, so it's negative 70 millivolts. Depolarization is caused by sodium coming into the cell. So sodium comes in, it's positively charged, it's gonna raise this resting potential all the way up to plus 30. When that happens, now there's no polarity, there's no, there's no voltage difference, okay? And so what happens is now your action potential or your electrical current can pass through because you've disrupted that barrier because the resting potential makes a barrier to passing along an electrical impulse. Then repolarization is caused by opening the potassium channels and letting the potassium out. And that's going to repolarize the membrane. And actually something happens here that doesn't typically happen in muscle cells. But hyperpolarization occurs because more potassium goes out. This is also called undershoot. And what it does is it prevents multiple stimulations from affecting the nerve cells. You want to make sure that each, poten each action potential goes through before you receive another one. Now, this absolute refractory period, when, chan when sodium um, channels are open, you can't respond to another stimulus. I usually simulate this in class by telling somebody to open the door to the classroom. And then when they sit down, I tell somebody else, open the door, and they say, I can't, it's already open. That's right. When the doors are open, you can't open them. So when voltage-gated when voltage -gated sodium channels are open and the cell's depolarizing, you cannot receive another stimulus. That's called the absolute refractory period. So that's from the time of opening of the sodium channels until resetting of the channels, and it ensures that each action potential is an all or none event and forces one-way transmission of nerve impulses. Now the relative refractory period follows the absolute refractory period. And that's when your sodium channels have returned to their resting state, okay? They're closed, but now your potassium channels are open. Repolarization is occurring at this point, and you can, at this point, if the signals, if the voltage is high enough, you can reopen the sodium channels. Um, but usually it takes a very strong stimulus for this to occur. So this is showing you the absolute and relative refractory periods. Here's your resting potential. There's your absolute refractory period. See, sodium channels are open. Relative refractory period, potassium channels are open. 
and this is your hyperpolarization. You can see, look at the time. We're only talking about two to three, four at the most milliseconds. Those are thousands of seconds, so it's a very short period of time. So conduction velocity, how does myelination affect how fast these impulses are going to go? Well, myelin sheaths insulate and prevent the leakage of charge. And saltatory conduction, only possible in myelinated axons, is about 30 times faster and can be as much as 60 times faster than without the myelin. So here's the difference. Remember I told you that in the peripheral nervous system that you have these little beads, the Schwann cells, and in between are little gaps. They're called nodes of Ranvier. Okay, they're little nodes, little gaps. And actually the voltage-gated voltage sodium channels are located at these gaps. And so the action potentials are generated only at the gaps and then they skip across the myelinated Schwann, those Schwann cells and they just skip from node to node. So that enables that potential to go extremely fast. So the electrical signal appears to jump rapidly from gap to gap, and that's what enables you to have this very rapid transmission, 30 times faster than what you would find. Now, I'll just give you a number here to throw out at you. Unmyelinated axons transmit electrical impulses at about two meters per second. That's like a little bit better than two yards per second. This is 30 times faster, up to 60 times faster, anywhere from 60 to 120 meters per second. So that's why you can almost instantaneously respond. Uh, your muscles can respond very quickly because these impulses pass along the motor neurons very quickly. All right, so now we have to talk about some terminology based on neurons that are connected to each other or like in a chain. And nerves are connected to each other with a little space in between and that's called the synapse and we saw the synapse when we talked about the neuromuscular junction that the neuron connects to the nerve to the muscle cell but there is a little gap there a little space and so the neuron that's first in line is called the presynaptic neuron and that neuron conducts the impulses towards the synapse it's sending the information the postsynaptic neuron now in the peripheral nervous system could be a neuron or it could be an effector okay so it could be a muscle cell it could be a gland okay so attached to those things so the neuron transmitting the electrical signal away from the synapse and it receives the information and depending upon where they are in the chain both could function as each one could function as both so this is looking at types of synapses so there's your axon coming down. There's the axon terminals. And you can see a bigger picture here. It's kind of cool. The axons connecting to the neuron. There's your nerve cell body, the soma. So if it is an axon attached to the body of the postsynaptic neuron, those are called axosomatic synapses. Those are really common. And then you have also axons that are connected to the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. Those are axodendritic. Those are also common. Sometimes you bypass the cell body altogether and the axon connects to the axon. And that's axoaxonal synapses. They're not so common. They're usually used in amplification types of pathways. If you just want to bypass something, reflexive pathways work this way. But those are your three types of synapses that you'll find. So this picture should look familiar because we had this in the muscle cell chapter when we were talking about muscle cell physiology. And neurotransmitters are what the nervous system uses to convey its messages. Now, the thing is, this being the language of the nervous system, um, we've already talked about one. We've talked about acetylcholine. And acetylcholine's role with conduction of um, electrical impulses that will stimulate muscles. Um, acetylcholine was stimulatory there, and we saw that already. That was the only neurotransmitter that we've talked about is acetylcholine and its effect on muscle cells. But we're going to find that there are a lot of neurotransmitters. Um, this is the language, like I said, 
50 or more neurotransmitters, but now I think it's more than 60. And most neurons can make two or more of the neurotransmitters. Now, neurons can exert several influences depending upon which neurotransmitter they release. And they're usually released at different stimulation frequencies. So there are frequencies that would release one and then a different frequency would release another. And neurotransmitters are classified by their chemical structure and by their function. So the very first neurotransmitter that was identified was acetylcholine because it was found to affect skeletal muscles. So that was the first one that was really um, picked up, understood, first identified, and it's released at neuromuscular junctions and also by some autonomic nervous system neurons. We'll talk about those later. By some central nervous system neurons, um, it has a it plays a role in cognition and it tends to be depleted in individuals that suffer from Alzheimer's disease. So um, early medications that were prescribed were Aricet, Nemendum, things that help to increase acetylcholine's availability at synapses and neurological functioning of the brain. It's synthesized from acetic acid and choline by the enzyme choline acetyltransferase. And you don't have to worry about these enzymes. I just put them in there for your information. But it is degraded by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And we had that in the muscle chapter as well. I added this, um, this little sheet for you of information sheet about various types of neurotransmitters because one of your essays asks you to um, list five different neurotransmitters and explain what their function is. So I put this up here for you to have that information available so that you could look at that. And I'm just going to go through a few of these. But if you go to acetylcholine, it says muscle control, also memory formation. So therefore, that's what we're talking about with Alzheimer's disease. Um, serotonin is um, usually we associate that with mood regulation, appetite, sleep, muscle control, intestinal movement. Um, there's a lot of SSRIs, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors, because it's supposed to help um, with uh, minimizing depression in some people. Um, dopamine is involved in reward pathways. It wakes up the brain. Um, cocaine enhances dopamine. People that have Parkinson's disease tend to be deficient in um, dopamine, and this is what causes the problems with movement that you see in Parkinson's, Parkinsonism. Um, so a lot of medications for early treatment is uh, like levodopa, ser uh, dopamine enhancers. Um, norepinephrine, fight or flight response, increased heart rate. Um, that's levodopa, precursor to dopamine that's used as a medication for treatment in Parkinson's. Um, GABA, your major inhibitory neurotransmitter. We'll talk about that in a minute. And glutamate, long-term memory. So those are just a few. You at least have five there that you can pick and anything you're interested in, you can look at or research some more. So classifications, they put them in classifications based on their biochemical structure. So the amino acid tyrosine gives rise to things like dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. These are all what we call catecholamines and they, their general area where they're produced is in the adrenal medulla, um, talking about that fight or flight response. Indolamines, and you don't have to know the catecholamines and dolamines. I'm just showing you that how they are biochemically put into categories. There's serotonin. Serotonin is synthesized from tryptophan. And uh, histamine is synthesized from amino acid histidine. So a lot of these come from amino acids. And a lot of these um, biogenic amines are broadly distributed in the brain and they play roles in our emotional behaviors and biological clock, especially dopamine and serotonin. Um, imbalances with these can be associated with mental illness. Now, there are some peptides. These are proteins. Substance P is associated with pain. There's endorphins that tend to 
kind of squash pain and minimize its effect. These are naturally occurring opiates and they work 200 times more effectively than morphine, but we just don't make that much of them. Gut brain peptides, somatostatin, cholecystokinin, that's in the digestive system. We'll talk about that when we get to that system. So the thing that's different here, neurotransmitters can stimulate a response or they can inhibit it. So you can react to something or you don't react to something. And it depends on whether the neurotransmitter effects are excitatory, which is going to cause depolarization of the membrane, or they're inhibitory and they hyperpolarize the membrane so it doesn't fire. So that the effects are determined by the receptor to which it binds. Now, GABA and glycine are usually inhibitory, and I will tell you something about GABA, which is also called gamma aminobutyric acid. This receptor is something that alcohol and benzodiazepines like Xanax, Ativan, uh, the earlier one was Valium, the first one that came out, those also hit the GABA receptor, and GABA shuts down the brain. So the more GABA you release, the less ability you have to function cerebrally. So when a person is drinking a lot, they kind of become inhibited and they kind of, um, they don't think things through as well as they did when they were not under the effects of the alcohol. But that's the effects of GABA. It inhibits, it inhibits the cerebral functioning and it shuts down the brain and it makes you more susceptible to the limbic system, which is your emotional, your primitive brain. So a lot of things that you suppress when you're under the effects of your cerebral functioning brain, if that's shut down, then you're acting more on emotions. And sometimes you will do things that you wouldn't normally do if your cerebrum was fully functioning like dancing at the table at the bar and doing, uh, taking your clothes off and all that kind of, all that stuff comes out when your civilized brain is put to sleep. So GABA is really important because it's a major inhibitory neurotransmitter and it shuts down the civilized thinking brain. So pay attention to that because alcohol and benzos enhance that. And these receptors also, you can build up a tolerance so that it takes more and more of that medication to produce the desired effect, okay? Some of these neurotransmitters have opposite effects. Interestingly enough, acetylcholine is excitatory, causes depolarization at neuromuscular junctions in skeletal muscle, but it's inhibitory in the cardiac muscle. Okay, and we won't really see how that all works till chapter 14, but just showing you that these do have varied effects depending on what the receptor is on the organ that it's attached to. So we do have different ways that neurotransmitters can carry out their effects, direct versus indirect. So direct, we open up channels. Neurotransmitter binds and opens up the channels and causes usually, usually we talk about depolarization, right? Here's what GABA does. How does GABA cause inhibitory action? Well, what happens is it either opens potassium channels and lets potassium out from the inside that's going to make the cell more negative inside that hyperpolarizes the membrane, right? And we said hyperpolarization causes inhibition. So you can open up potassium channels and let potassium out because normally it's on the inside, positively charged. So you're making the cell less negative inside or there's chloride ions. Now chloride ions are negatively charged and they're primarily found outside the cells. And how GABA really works, it opens up chloride ion channels. So it lets the chloride ions in. And since they're negatively charged, they hyperpolarize the membrane. Okay, so that's how GABA causes inhibition. But inhibitory neurotransmitters can do two things. Either open up chloride ion channels or open up potassium ion channels. But GABA works with chloride ion channels. Okay, so direct acting, you're opening up channels. And you can either stimulate or inhibit depending on what channels you open up. Indirect, 
takes a little longer to get going. And a lot of these biogenic amines, they have to use these second messenger systems. So neurotransmitter acts through intracellular second messenger pathways, and they usually involve something inside the cell called a G protein. The effects are broader, longer lasting, similar to hormones. So biogenic amines, neuropeptides, dissolved gases. And here's how they work. It's kind of like a relay team where the, horm where the neurotransmitter binds here. And even though these look like blocks that they don't move, remember proteins are very dynamic. They're not static. When something binds, they change shape. And when that receptor changes shape, here's your G protein, it's released and it's activated it moves along the inner surface of the membrane and it activates this enzyme that is called adenylate cyclase and when that is bound to that's going to change shape opens up binding sites for atp and atp is cleaved into two pieces there's a pyrophosphate that's not shown here which is two phosphates and then a cyclic amp now the cyclic amp is the second messenger and this is the one that's going to carry out the effects that that neurotransmitter was supposed to do in the first place, but it couldn't get in. It had to send the message through this system. So by way of G proteins, the enzymes activated to produce the second messenger. And that's what we mean by a second messenger system. So indirect effects, just an abbreviated version, indirect effects operate by using G protein coupled to receptor pathway g protein coupled receptor pathways so what causes a delay the time needed for the neurotransmitter to be released diffuse across the synapse and bind to the receptors normally not a problem 0.3 to 5 milliseconds so thousands less than a thousand thousands of a second in some cases but this is what they call the rate limiting step this is what causes uh, the time delay, but not usually anything that's that's major. What happens to the neurotransmitters after they produce their effect? Well, within a few milliseconds, neurotransmitter effect is terminated in one of three ways. The astrocytes, those scaffolding cells that have so many functions and are the most numerous of your neuroglia, they take up those neurotransmitters, okay? or the axon terminal can take them up. They can be degraded by enzymes, like acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine, or they can simply diffuse away from the, from the synaptic cleft. So postsynaptic potential, what makes that, that neuron, that second in line, respond? Well, it depends on how much neurotransmitter is released. And the amount of time that the neurotransmitter is bound to the receptor will determine how much of an effect it has. And also the types of postsynaptic potentials. So you have potentials that are called excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And then you have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So here is an example of an excitatory response. So you have one neuron here that the axon terminal is attached to a dendrite. So this is an axodendritic type of connection. And you have to have enough neurotransmitter release to break the threshold. Now see, this is my resting potential, negative 70. But I only have to bump it up minus 15 millivolts in order to get the axon to fire. Now, remember, I mentioned something called the axon hillock, which is right, right in this region. So in order to stimulate this neuron to carry out that effect, you've got to break this threshold. So in order to do that, you have to release, you have to have enough excitatory potentials. Temporal summation means that you have one neuron and it's releasing enough neuro, neurotransmitter, back-to-back -back stimulation, enough to break the thresh, threshold. So I call this kind of like machine gun fire. You know, there's enough of a stimuli being received back-to-back -to, -back to, re to release enough neurotransmitter to break that threshold. So that's temporal summation. Spatial summation means it's spaced out. So you have two different axons 
they're releasing neurotransmitter, but slower. So it's kind of like bang, 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 not bang, 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 like you have with the previous one with temporal summation. This one, they're spaced out, but the combined effect is enough to break the threshold and it will fire. Then you have two axons, one's excitatory and one's inhibitory. Well, if that happens, they cancel each other out. And you want to remember that we're not just talking about one or two or three connections. We're talking about many connections. So it's very complex and it's the combined effect of all those incoming, incoming information that's actually released by these axon terminals. That combined effect will determine whether that postsynaptic neuron is going to fire or not. Okay. So it's complex and everybody reacts differently to things going on around them. That's why some people sometimes operate on a hair trigger where they respond immediately to something that they are um, that they have been affected by where other people will wait and they don't respond so it just depends on the integration of all these pathways and like I said it's very complex so when you have a presynaptic fiber here's all your axon terminals the areas that are going to be most strongly affected are the ones that have more connections. So if you look at these here in the discharge zone, this one has five connections. This one has six connections. But if you go to the facilitated zone, there's three, two, one, two here. What that means is that the strongest effect is felt here. As you get away, you're going to have other connections here that are going to be associated with these neurons and they may produce an effect that may block the effect of this particular axon. So like I said, integrated, very complex. Now these are neuronal pools. These are showing you how the effects of a neuron can be very far reaching or several neurons and their convergence can be very far reaching. So this is called a diverging circuit where you have a single input and it branches out and it branches out and it branches out. And many times with this type of circuitry, you can have an amplified effect from one, one particular input because it carries the message to large amounts of neurons in the neuronal pool. So amplifying circuits. Now a converging circuit means you have input coming in from multiple places and it converges on a singular output. And I can kind of relate this to an emotional experience that you may have from several different um, sensations, like holding a baby and you hear the baby making little noises and you see the baby and you can smell the baby and hopefully the diaper's been changed so the baby smells good. You feel the baby's skin, it's real soft. All these sensations give you this overwhelming feeling of love for the child. So all the sensations converge on a single output. Reverberating are circuit, is a circuit that uh, repeats itself over and over and over and over again. And I want to just, I can't help myself, but saying that this is what happens in memory and studying A and P and practicing something over and over again until it becomes learned information. But even circuitry like respiration and um, processes that occur in the body on a regular basis use reverberating circuitry. Parallel after discharge, that you have an input and initially it follows one pathway and then over time it may take more and more um, neurons to produce the same effect but you can experience this in after images when you look at something and you close your eyes and you can still see maybe the outline of that image it's that that input is still firing it's slower but you still experience that information 